Yeah. Okay, uh, we would continue with the next session. You're all welcome to stay. <laughs> No worries. Um, okay, then we start. I'm glad that you stayed or you came here for this session. Um, just to start, we have planned not to have a panel discussion, but to have a discussion with you. So I would be really happy if you came uh, forward a little and not uh, stayed in the back because we are actually having uh, a little presentation but then we will really discuss with you and it will be easier to speak when you are more in the front. Thank you. Um, we will talk about artificial intelligence in this session. I don't know who of you read the description that um, was in the session. Um, yeah, so artificial intelligence, and I will guide you through the next 60 minutes. Um, we have an expert here, um, Joachim Lonian, uh, who will tell you something about his work um, or the work of Neurocat, a startup from Berlin that's dealing with artificial intelligence. And um, yeah, afterwards we will have a discussion and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, quickly, some sentences about my background and um, who it is who's organizing this session here. Um, as I already said, my name is Elisa Brummel and I work for the Association of the TÜV. Um, I guess that most of you, or maybe some of you, have heard about the TÜV companies. I just say a few words um, at this point. The TÜV companies were found 150 years ago as steam boiler inspection associations to um, yeah, ensure safety, and that's what it says in the title. Not on here, but the title of the session. Uh, safety and security in the digital world. And uh, where it all started was in industry, and um, then it was expanded to more fields, and probably who of you know the TÜV knows them from cars and elevators. And we, as the association of the TÜV, um, are a platform for the TÜV companies, a dialogue platform, but also for the public and for um, policymakers. And um, as cars and elevators, as I said, that's the topics that the TÜV are dealing with. Um, they are becoming more digital, so does the TÜV and also the association of the TÜV. Um, and in this context, of course, uh, you cannot talk about digitalization and the digital world without talking about artificial intelligence. And that's why we're here, and that is why Joachim Lonian is here. Um, and right now I'd say we uh, listen to your presentation. Um, yeah, Joachim Lonian from Neuroket. Oh, this is not on. It is. Awesome. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction and for having us, or having me here. I'm, I'm by myself, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, my, my name is Joachim Lonian. I'm with Neurocat. Neurocat is a fairly small startup located uh, in Berlin, Adlershof, which is just, I don't know, like a 10-minute drive south of here um, in the less fancy part of Berlin. We're not in the Prenzlauer Berg or Mitte area where all the cool startups are. We're also cool, but we're not located in the cool parts of Berlin. Um, we're focusing on AI safety and security, and uh, 
the reason why we're doing this and why we did this from, from day one, which was roughly two years ago, is that nobody else does it, uh, which is still, to me, uh, very odd and very, very funny in a way, because there are conferences about AI almost every single day, um, either in, in Berlin or in Munich or near the other uh, major German uh, city, and nobody talks about quality of AI, and it's just stunning because um, usually when you buy a product, you're all about quality. You want to make sure that it's you know it's got a decent quality, it's got it's been tested and it's been certified and all this stuff. But we talk about AI for the past for the past couple of years. Everybody's talking about AI, but nobody talks about the quality of the AI system, and it's just weird because we all <clears throat> apparently well assuming that you know since it is an artificial intelligence based on some neural network and some smart person at you know, Google or some other Silicon Valley company, I'm sure they made sure that you know, what the system is doing is right. And that is just stunning that nobody questions um, the results of, of AI uh, systems and what they're processing. So um, this is why we focused on AI safety and security and generally AI quality. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about our organization, but also um, what the um, issue of quality is all about. Um, so there are roughly 27 of us at this point. Uh, we're only two years old. We're two years into this endeavor. Um, and uh, we're, most of us are mathematicians or, or coders. I'm, I'm neither, actually, so I can only, I, I can only talk about this and, and scratch the surface without really diving too, too deeply into the whole matter. But um, here are a couple of, of statements, and the one statement that I think is uh, probably the most important is the last one, and that is that assessing AI quality cannot be done by code reviews. Uh, for those of you who've been coding, uh, in the last couple of years, or who've, if you have experience with Java or, or Python or Pascal or C++ or whatever, uh, in the past you were always able to, to, to uh, check the code by you know, using your own set of eyes and doing code review. Uh, you cannot do this anymore with AI algorithms. It's just, it's just impossible because the thing keeps changing uh, over the course of its lifetime. And it keeps changing while it accumulates data and spits out data. Uh, so it's, it's just impossible to just, you know, sit down and, and uh, review the code. And that is why you need, uh, you need tools to measure um, the functionality and the comprehensibility of the system and, of course, the robustness. And the robustness is, is right now our number one priority and we're the, we're, as far as we know, we're the only company who is really focusing on AI robustness. Um, there's a quote up there by Ian Goodfellow. Uh, I'm not sure if the word robustness is in there, but he basically said that there's no, there's no feasible tool right now that can really uh, check the AI quality and make sure that it's, it's, it's inert to um, adversarial attacks. If you don't know what adversarial attacks are, I'm, I will, I'll talk about this briefly. But robustness uh, is basically defined as, you know, the higher a system's robustness is, the greater the protection against uh, intentional perturbances. And uh, there, there are two types of perturbations. One is physical, and that is, this might be one of those examples. So you have a stop sign and you train your car, uh, your, your AI system that is deployed or implemented in a car, and you show this system a stop sign, stop sign, stop sign, stop sign, stop sign, stop sign, stop sign. And you do this like a million times. But what happens if there's, you know, if there's snow covering the stop sign or if there's a sticker on it or if some kid tilted it in, in a funny way? Will the car still be able to recognize it as a stop sign and, and then stop? Or is it going to you know, plow over it, the whole thing? So that's a, that, that's a physical perturbation. The other one is a digital perturbation. And that looks something like this. It's, it's, it's only one example. I mean, this is actually a bit of a hybrid of both. Um, on the guy on the left was properly recognized by a face recognition camera. But the guy on the right um, is holding up this adversarial patch. It's just a funky poster with a bunch of 
I don't know, watercolor on it. But it, it basically attacks the AI, and the AI is not able to, to recognize this person as a human being. Um, a little worse yet is this picture here, and I amplified the colors in the second picture a little bit. Um, this is a, um, an AI system that was trained. This is actually, this was done by DARPA. DARPA is the, um, the research facility for the, uh, for the US uh, Army. And uh, they, they trained uh, a system with uh, pictures of, of tanks. And, um, and in the second picture that you see in the center, um, it, was, it was manipulated by, by, you know, they added a little bit of, you know, green and yellow uh, hues there. Uh, and by, by only changing a couple of pixels in this picture, it threw off the AI system and it, and it classified the picture as a British ambulance. So that's, I mean, that, you know, obviously that's a horrible mistake. Uh, but it just goes to show that uh, it, it's very, very important to have a, a robust AI system. Otherwise, there, there can be like grave consequences. Um, here are a couple of examples. So it's not only about you know um, visual recognition or, or recognizing pictures or, or videos. It's also about recognizing uh, audio data or uh, tabular data, voice recognition stuff, and all that stuff because. It may, in the background, without you or anyone, any user noticing, it might attack the AI, whether it's in a smart home or in a drone or just in any other um, uh, computer machine learning system. And that's why it is very, it's just very, very important to increase the robustness and ensure a system's robustness. And it is still, it's absolutely shocking to me that it's not, that, that this is not a bigger issue. Um, basically, there are, there are three type of, types of quality parameters when we talk about AI quality. Number one is robustness. And this is a pic, well, these are two, two uh, pictures of um, uh, an AI system that we were able to hack. So in Neurocat, we don't, we do not create neural networks. We don't, you know, we don't establish our own AI systems. We, um, we get access to other organizations' AI systems and we just take them apart. We hack them and we, I mean, we're always able to get into the system and we're always able to either make things disappear or add things or just show the user that their system is not safe. In this case, this was, <coughs> excuse me, this was a camera that was deployed in a, in a, in a car of a very large OEM. And the picture on the top is the AI, the AI system in operation, operating properly. It recognized the streets and the signs and the pedestrians. And then uh, we were able to hack into it and we just make the pedestrians disappear. Now that did not go over well. They did not enjoy that too much when we did that. But on the other hand, they were very happy because it, it, just, it just showed them that they are just a, there's a group of people who's able to get into our system. Um, in a very short amount of time. And it's, it's, just, it's just a little scary because if the car doesn't recognize, you know, the right things, it's, it's, just, it's just bound to uh, cause an accident. Number two is comprehensibility, and that is about um, investigating the decision tree. Uh, so why is a system uh, making, you know, this decision instead of that decision? Um, is it, it uh, are, are the uh, decisions being made in a transparent way? What's, what's the coding behind all of this? Um, and who want, or, well, do, does the company want to be held accountable for the decisions that are being made by their, by their system? So we do have a couple of methods to make sure that the decisions that the system um, made is um, uh, basically in sync with what the company wants it to make, but also, you know, if you, um, uh, if you use this for analyzing somebody's credit score and your credit score is lower than your, than your neighbor's credit score and you want to challenge this, the company who, uh, who rated your credit score has to allow you access to the data or at least to the decision-making process and this is why that is also important. Number three is the functionality of the system. Uh, so when we talk about AI, we usually talk about machine learning <coughs> components, 
And uh, with machine learning, the system, I mean, you train a system with, you know, uh, hopefully properly labeled data, but in the process, in the course of its lifetime, it, it keeps learning. And if, you, um, if it encounters certain, uh, certain data with certain results, uh, it, it may end up running its own, uh, <laughs> uh, its own agenda, and it might, it might end up uh, practicing fraudulent behavior, which obviously the company may not want or does not want. So you have to make sure that the functionality of the system is actually what you want it to. Uh, to do, and you have to take care of it. It's, 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 it's free of any, any bias, any, any racial or gender discrimination, and it's, it's operated in a, in a fair way without trying to answer the question, what is, what's, what's fair and all that. Um, this is a picture of, um, of the software that we've developed. This is, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of an outdated picture because we're working on it every single day, and we've got uh, 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 patents on it, but um, uh, we're able to use it, or we've been able to use it over the past 12 to 18 months, but uh, our goal is to actually make it, <laughs> make it user-friendly and, and deploy it in the cloud and have a cloud service and, uh, so that um, companies who, who want to check their AI quality can just plug it into this program that will be called 8Kit, and then you can run your own tests and uh, uh, see if your, if your AI system is actually robust and if it's, if it, if it's safe and if it's doing what it's supposed to do. We, um, we wrote a state, well, we, we put together an industry consortium, let me say it this way, um, and we uh, put together a standard, a technical standard, and the, uh, the heart of the standard is, is, what's, is what's pictured there in the center. It's the uh, AI life cycle and um, and we got together with larger organizations, so this is not just a group of, you know, startup dudes who, who decided that this is the right way of looking at it. Uh, we got together with Microsoft and SAP and, and Bosch and Continental and uh, a bunch of others and a bu bunch of research organizations as well. And, um, and then we decided that, you know, this, this, this is the way to, to basically look at it. So you have to look at the model, you have to look at the data, the training data, the input data, the output data. Uh, you have to look at the platform, so the actual heart, hardware of, um, of the car or wherever you're going to implement your system, and the environment. And this is where we start our analysis. So if, if a company approaches us and they want us to check the, the quality of their system, we always look at the environment. And, um, and then we can, we can do like a threat metal model analysis. We can see what, what are the likely scenarios this system is about to encounter once it's deployed. Um, and then we simulate these, these scenarios in the software and we attack, we, we, we attack the AI system with those simulated uh, situations. Um, I'm not sure, let me see. Yes, so um, in the literature, there's, um, there are a handful of attacks. There are like 70, 70 handmade, tailored uh, adversarial examples or, or attacks and um, and so then what these companies do is they have an AI system, they create an attack, and they launch the attack on the system, and then they fix the system right there. And then the, and then the system is basically protected against that one particular attack. And so this is what this graph on, on the left is supposed to show. Um, it's like, you know, you, 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 you fix your system individually, uh, but of course if you, if you think about a traffic situation, there are millions of scenarios that can pose a threat to a car or, well, to the pedestrian, rather. Um, and that's why we came up we, uh, with, this, with this attack generator. We, uh, we looked at all of these individual attacks, we took them apart, and we realized there are, there are certain mathematical building blocks around each attack, and we took them apart and we, we reassembled them and we added more attacks. So, so we looked at like the threat model analysis, what can happen what, what can happen to any, to any given system? Is there, is there fog, is there snow, uh, is there rain, are there shadows on the street, and all of that stuff. And we simulated this uh, mathematically, and uh, we ended up with roughly 10, 10 million of these adversarial attacks. And uh, just to ensure that if you have an AI system and we hammer it with just millions of attacks, um, 
we will find weak spots and then we can uh, identify the weak spots and also make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. So we build add-ons and a firewall around it um, in order to ensure that the system is safe. Um, this is part of it. <laughs> I was, I'm uh, surprised by this uh, slide right now, but it's just a big uh, summary of, of what we did in the past and why um, the whole uh, discussion about AI safety is just very, very important to us, but also important to basically everyone else who wants to um, implement um, AI in their, in their system. And that is one of our customers. <laughs> Uh, and that is just a quick overview of uh, what we do and, and what we did and why we think safety and security is like a major issue in, when, when we talk about AI. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. You want to take a seat here? Sure. Um, we have half an hour now left, so I might skip the first part that I have planned. Um, well, are there any, any questions? I think yeah. I, I, I covered a lot of ground. I don't know if there, I mean, if, if you have any questions about, you know, the 10, 15, 20 slides, I forgot. <laughs> um, you can, you know, feel free to ask. I've got a question about the, I guess, the marketplace. When you say that there's no one else out there doing that, have you also considered existing cybersecurity firms that are developing their own in-house AI improvement mechanisms? Um, maybe, sort of. <laughs> um, there, there is, there is one, there is, there's one company in uh, Silicon Valley that is also talking about robustness. Um, we're not necessarily talking about cybersecurity or improving cybersecurity. I know there are, there are a lot of organizations that talk about that, but we are specifically talking about robustness and specifically um, gearing our service towards uh, companies that want to deploy AI systems in you know, in cars or in, in medical devices or in the aircraft industry where it's really absolutely necessary that the systems are running in a safe way and that they cannot be attacked easily. Um, so that, that, that's why I think, you know, they, there's just no one else who, who, uh, who has focused on, on uh, robustness in this sense. Um, the other company um, is, uh, is called Calypso. They're in Silicon Valley. They have an awesome website. We do not, but they, they, that's basically where it ends. They, they, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very cool website. They talk about the right things, but they do not have the tools that we have developed in the past two years. Okay, one more question, and then maybe the questions uh, to NeuroCAD afterwards so we can get in the discussion. Uh, thank you. Um, how, how easy is it for, for human beings to, to, uh, to comprehend how um, a particular system, machine learning system, arrived at a particular decision? Especially considering that um, the, the general data protection regulations require that any decision that is made by a, a machine learning system should be interpretable, which means a human being should be able to, to, to explain how the decision was made. How easy is it to, to, to um, analyze those decisions and be able to, to say how they were reached? Impossible. I mean, that's a very short answer. It's impossible. You can't, I mean, that, that's, that's what I was saying in the beginning. You cannot uh, check a system's quality uh, by, by code review. You have to have a tool that, is, that, can, that can basically speak the language of the AI and that can you know, take it apart in a sense. So we're, and this is, this is also one of the reasons why it is absolutely, it's absolutely shocking to me that, that we don't talk about quality because we as humans do not have the capacity, cognitive capacity to look at these algorithms and at these, at these um, 
neural networks of, I don't know, 20 million layers and, and find errors. It's just, it's impossible. And, uh, and that's why we need, we need tools that we can rely on. And the tools then, you know, have to, uh, you know, really check a system's uh, robustness and, 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 and functionality uh, before we deploy it. I mean, that, that, you know, that's, that's the whole point. We, we, we can't. It's, we, you can't just look at a system and, and, and then decide, oh, yeah, this, that, that thing is safe. It's just impossible. Um, and uh, if you look at, you know, the, the handful of incidents uh, uh, that has happened to uh, the um, Tesla drivers, um, Tesla refused to let people look into the black box and see why did the car make this turn, that turn? Why did it change the lane here and not there? Why did it run over a runner? Uh, they're, they're not gonna let you look into the thing, but it should be in their vital interest to, um, uh, you know, run a couple of safety checks. And they actually, so if you own a Tesla and you park it at night and you enter the car the next day, there are a handful of software updates. And you as a driver, I mean, nobody asks you, <laughs> do you want these updates or not? Nobody runs the tests uh, to see if the, if the quality of those software updates is okay. It's just not done. And it's, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, it's just weird. <laughs> Okay, so Joachim, one of my questions would have been, so you guess you will have work for the next 50 years. We, <laughs> or are yeah. we done at some point and say now we got to, to a solution and now it's safe? Probably well, not, as you, as you just said. Well, so, the, I mean, yeah, we, we had an appointment with, with Google two weeks ago. And when we, when we talked about this, and it was, a very, it was a fairly short conversation, and after two minutes they said, you will have enough work for the next 50 years. So it's, we did not speak before this, so it's funny that you mentioned this. Uh, they said, you, you will not run out of work because this is, this is gonna be the number one issue uh, for the next couple of years. But um, um, it, <laughs> it's just, it's a little bit difficult because there are, there are so many different uh, you, you know, domains of where you implement your AI system, and we are not the expert in like, the medical domain or the expert in the aerospace domain. So, so we have to rely on the expertise of, of, of others. I was showing a picture of um, uh, Volk, Volkswagen, and so they are, they are working with us because they know they, they know all about cars. We, we don't understand cars, but in order to get into all the other domains, we have to work with other uh, organizations uh, that are active in these other domains. And it should be in their own interest to uh, you know, ensure the safety of their systems. And I have one last question for you, and then I would like to open the discussion to, um, to you. Um, you're basically looking at the technical dimension, but when we talk about AI, mostly the yeah, ethic, ethical dimension comes into, into discussion. Um, would you say it's possible to disconnect these two dimensions or how do you deal with it in your work? So, is, I mean, you said that you, you talked about fairness and that you, uh, in functionality, that you wouldn't want to say what is fair and what is unfair, but can you really disconnect these two dimensions? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, I mean, you can, um, I guess you can, you can make sure your system is trained in a certain way so that it doesn't, it doesn't have a certain bias in it. But when it comes to these like typical examples that were run by, by, by MIT, if a car, you know, if, if an accident is unavoidable, uh, should the car run over a kid or run against a tree? It's, I mean, these are ethical, I, I guess these are ethical questions that you, I don't know how you can, uh, you know, put these answers in, into, into a neural network. I, I, I don't know how to connect those two dots. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so now I wish to open uh, the discussion. And um, I would like to start with a question. Um, in Germany, we are having a discussion right now whether it should be um, 
whether should, there should be a labeling obligation for products that use AI. So whenever um, there is some AI used in the product, in the application, it should be stated somewhere. Um, so just a quick chat, uh, check with you who would appreciate this. Or who would say, I don't. So, <laughs> so it's is, not, yeah. That's only five out of, I don't know, 30 people. Okay, so that? the others are tired or would say, I don't see the point in knowing when AI is used. There's a, there's a famous Google um, uh, video, well, it's actually just an audio thing, where a person is calling a restaurant to make a reservation. And I, I don't know how many people have heard about this. I, I guess no one. But so, it, so, per, so this is like, oh, yeah, so one out of three. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so it, it, it's just an audio tape, and it's, and it's, and it's two male voices, I believe, and one is saying, I want to reserve a table at your restaurant Saturday night, 7 p.m., five people for two hours. And, and the person on the other end of the line is like asking the right questions, you know, what time, how many people, vegetarians, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and it's just a friendly chat. It, I don't know, it's, it takes like a minute or something. And then at the end, Google said, okay, this was our latest AI thing. And it just gave me the chills because it was really, like you couldn't tell that this was an, an, like a computer. It was, <laughs> it was pretty impressive. And, um, you know, as a private person, I, I, I don't know if I would want that. You know, I, want I mean... Want to know? Yeah, if... Or no, no, no. If, 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 like, if I, if, if I want to have these interactions without knowing that I'm talking to a robot or, well, an ML, really. Um, so, yeah, I'm a little torn, but I'm only torn because I'm working for an AI company. <laughs> but... Um, I, I do think most most people are a little, uh, you know, not not too happy about the idea that in the future there will be a lot more of these AI interactions. So maybe we stay with this example of making a restaurant reservation. Would that make a difference? Would you want like you whenever you do a survey, or whenever you call a hotline and they say? Uh, this call is being recorded. If you don't want this, please tell me now. Would that would be a way to deal with AI in these situations to to have uh, to have the choice? I guess it's unfair because we're the only ones with microphones. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm. I'm uh, <laughs> I get to you whenever you you're willing to. To make an answer, yes. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we in Germany, we are quite good in labeling everything and creating rules for everything, but just imagine how many uh, labels we now have for organic food. So it's, yeah, I think we, um, you can choose between 15 or 20 different labels uh, of organic food, and some of them are real labels, some of them are just labels of some, some uh, retailers and things like that. And things like AI, there is no real definition. There is no copyright thing. It's not like this is AI and this is not. Making a phone call uh, with a restaurant and having a voice that is n nearly human, this is AI, right? But um, if I use a search engine and it's just somehow guessing based on my typos, what is the right thing that I would like to search, this is also AI. And actually, this is the part of AI that I really like. Um, so labeling the things, it's, I don't think that this is the right approach. People should get used to it, like they get used to cars, like they get used to internet, like they get used to phone calls 200 years ago. So. OK, thank you. Yeah. I would say maybe. One to answer to to give you an answer or to to respond to this. If people don't know that AI is used, how would they get used to it? So, I mean, if you drive a car, you know that you drive a car, and then you can get used to it whenever you you do it. But when you don't know that AI AI is used, and that's how today it is, that could be a problem. 
Um, actually, uh, there is a lot of electricity in a car right now, and most of the people, they are using it already. Things that keeps the car in line. This is not really AI, it's just a couple of sensors measuring some distance and stuff like that. And things like this bring more benefits to the human being than avoiding things. Um, there, was, there was a story that was brought to court um, just a year ago or so. Um, a car driver was, said that, was sent to court because he hit a bicycle. And he was just like, no, I wasn't speeding. And they go to the, to the car and they checked the computer in the car and they realized this guy was driving 70 um, kilometers per hour in a city. So that was the reason why he got to jail. Um, this is things that we already have in cars. It's not really AI, um, but things like this are in a technology like cars. And most people are not aware that every single meter that you drive of your car is measured already today without AI. There were two, okay, two comments uh, right, right there. Yes. Uh, I'm uh, Bangira, I'm MP from DRC. So me on the part of uh, knowing that uh, AI is employed or not, I think we should be informed. Because as a customer, we have to make a decision. If I want to be served by AI, if I have the choice to choose either AI or human, or if I don't have the choice, but at least I should be informed. Because AI is not only uh, on the car, the, it will go on all the field. Maybe tomorrow you go to the hospital and you will be, uh, the surgery will be a AI. So you either choose to be, uh, to go to surgery with a normal doctor, human doctor, or AI doctor. You have to choose that one. I think making it uh, clear that this is an AI product, uh, it should be very clear, uh, uh, precise. And there's also a legal concern on that because AI even if it's uh, powerful and what but it's still a machine so a machine can have any time a, a bug it can be hacked so if that machine make a mistake who will be uh, who will be face the justice will it be the creator of that machine the company of that machine because at the end that machine will not put it in jail you can only switch it off so we need also to see the legal part of AI. Okay, thanks. I would, uh, yeah, I oh, sorry. continue. Um, I'd say we should definitely talk about this legal aspect, but maybe not now. So I would like to focus on this first part. Uh, so do we need a label? And as I, as I understood what you said, you would say, yes, the consumer needs to be informed and needs to have the choice whether to use this AI product or a human uh, in the background, so to say. Hi, I'm Klaus Lantalis. It was an, when the discussion started, I thought about the label made in Germany, which when it was introduced was to scare people off from buying a German product. However, later within time, people appreciated the quality, though I think being clear about that AI is being used, it should be mentioned, could be labeled, and maybe in the future even a certain trusted AI or right. something like this could be developed to ensure a certain quality and um, being uh, in, in going along with code of conduct or human rights and certain things that are into, into implemented into it. Yeah, the, uh, sorry, just, just, just a comment on that for just a, a second. Um, that is something we're working on. We're working on, well, not working on it, but we're talking to um, organizations that do um, certifications on, you know, just like, just like TÜV, you know, checks your car and elevators and, and God knows what else. Um, we, we are trying to get to a point where we establish technical standards uh, so that we can define certain requirements that an AI should, should meet. And then there should be like a third party that can check your system with their test equipment, with their standards, and then you can get kind of a seal of approval 
um, that you as, you know, as a company, you can also then advertise with that. And you can say to your customers, look, our AI system has passed all of these checks and it is safe and it's always updated and et cetera, blah, blah. This is not done today, but, um, but I think that should be the future. And, and like I said, we're, we, we are talking to a certain um, certification companies in order to get that done. And the government is talking about it actually. Uh, well, at, at least the uh, our German government is, is, is talking about it. I'm not sure about other, other countries, but I think that is, that, that is the future and that has to happen at, at some point anyways. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, good day. My name is Kevin Swift. I work with LACNIC, which is a regional internet registry for Latin America and the Caribbean, but I'm just, I'm from the Caribbean. I'm just entirely interested in this from a personal perspective. And I wanted to play devil's advocate in asking, why is it important in certain situations to know whether you're dealing with AI or not? I mean, Given that we have the quality insurance issues dealt with, if I'm making a reservation um, at a restaurant, maybe in that scenario and in other commercial contexts, it may be better to be served by AI because there'll be less of the hesitation, there'll be better trouble find, um, solution finding from an AI than from a physical person. Now, I think there's a distinction to be made when you think about it from an ethical standpoint. So, of course, aligned to the type of information or data you share, so sensitive data dealing with your medical records, your political beliefs, those sort of things you should know. So there is, there is a need to have a, a label in that sense, that if you're sharing this type of data, you're dealing with an AI or a person. But in the majority of other cases, I'm buying something, I need um, support from a hotline, I'm making a, a reservation at a hotel. Why should it matter? I think you might actually be, um, you might actually get a better level of service. You might actually have a lot of things that are solved that a human won't be able to solve. Um, and I think you'd just be happy. I mean, if I were a company using it, I'll just have it deployed to make sure that my ratings and my, my reviews go up. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another comment here. Um, I'm not sure how um, much of a connection this has to the current discussion about the quality of AI uh, services in a democratic society, but I'm from Belarus and we are entering another phase of um, discussions about integration with Russia. And Russia has this potential and ambitious plan to use AI for improving economic behavior of its citizens and for monitoring more of its activities, um, social activities. And I just heard about um, research at the University of Alexander Humboldt in Berlin uh, that basically results in um, AI algorithms being able to determine a person's sexual orientation and many other demog demographic parameters from just two or three sentences of text. Uh, or just a short bit of text uh, written by this person. So if the trust in AI is basically increasing, that kind of gives um, the permission for totalitarian governments to use more AI technologies to, to be watching more. So if the AI is like a better servant, uh, people will trust it more and will give more information to it. So I don't know. You know, uh, is there a way to avoid this? I'm not sure. Well, I, I think, you know, one, I don't disagree with, with the last two comments, not at all. Um, you know, I, I think, it, you know, as long as it's not safety, safety critical, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the other thing, and this is another whole other can of worms we're about to open, is you know, what, what's going to happen to all of these jobs if you don't have any call centers anymore, which, you know, there, there are millions of jobs involved in this, and they're very low-paying jobs. So what's going to happen to all of these, these uh, jobs? It, th this isn't safety-related, but uh, it's just another part of the discussion that is, that, you know, is, is, is bound to, to, uh, to happen when uh, governments talk about, you know, what are we doing with millions of people that are now unemployed, um, so it's, you know, it's not, it's not only reduced to, to like safety, 
um, issues, but it's also it's also about like you know social economical discussions that that I think every you know every company or every country rather um, has to address sooner or later. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, it's a very interesting discussion we're having, I think. I want to come back to something that you just said. My name is Christiane, by the way. I'm with the Government of Canada. Um, you talked about certification um, to, to verify that a product is reliable. But in this case of AI, uh, you described how, you know, you start your car in the morning, Tesla has sent an update. So, so how does the certification work in the case like that? Because the AI evolves completely. When you start doing machine learning, it learns from itself, so how do you certify that it's still, like what's the certification process there? I just don't technically understand how you keep doing that because technically when you get to machine learning, you have to do it every instance and a new bit of data enters into the system. So if you can elaborate on that, I'd be very happy to well, hear you, it. Well, I mean, you can't, that's a very, very good question. And obviously you cannot do it in real time because it takes, I mean, it takes gazillions of servers to, you know, run all these operations, uh, you know, to, to uh, check a uh, system's robustness. But you do have to check it on a regular basis. Now, if you, you know, I mean, just like, you know, you have to check your car's brakes and, and taillights and everything else on a regular basis. But in this case, it has to be done on online. Um, the only question is, what are feasible intervals? I mean, how much, you know, how much leeway is there uh, between the updates and the checking and the or rechecking rather? Uh, I, I don't have the answer. We don't have the answer to this, uh, to be honest. But but it is something we have to talk about. I mean, if um, I mean me just as a pedestrian, or, or I, well, rather, I I ride my bike most of the time. Um, I would like to make sure that that the cars and the trucks uh, that I encountered on the street are you know being operated in a, in a safe way. So uh, I, I think every company that, that, that runs these systems, it, it, it's got to be in, its own, in their own interest to uh, have these safety checks every once in a while. But yeah, the online certification, that's, that's a big one. It, that is going to be a big one, <laughs> for sure. Um, OK. I would like to, as we have only 10 minutes left, um, I would like to uh, switch the focus and um, I'd say in Germany and maybe in Europe is in general we are uh, when we talk about AI we are often say often saying that we are here too slow and that we are too uh, that we are all protecting our data and so we cannot proceed with uh, AI and that other countries and other regions are much faster and are not so afraid. Um, I would be interested how um, maybe you, you have another perspective on it or if you are from another region, how this topic is discussed. So I, I wouldn't say that we are feared or that Germany and Europe are feared to to be uh, left behind, but somehow this is the uh, yeah the tone that is um, in which it is uh, spoken. So we are always saying that in China and in the USA, everything's much faster and things are just being done, and uh, we might not um, be able to to get along with this development. Is that um, so? Hello, I'm Amal from Italy. Even though I'm from Italy and I moved now to Germany, between Germany and Italy, I can see the difference. Like I, f I found that Italy itself is left behind in front of Germany. For example. Um, one time here, I called a health agency, and yeah, they asked me if like I allow them to record my call, and they were surprised. Wow, what is this? You know, so I can imagine like that's true. 
Europe is left a little bit behind, and maybe Southern Europe is even more behind than the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. So I, cannot, I can say that, for example, Spain and Italy are not at the same technological level of Germany or Scandinavian countries. I don't know, it's my personal experience, but mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. So I take from this I shouldn't speak about Europe in general, but there's also differences in between those countries. Um, okay, so the, uh, yeah, to look even further, so not only Europe, but um, is this discussion also taking place in in other regions? So, um, I'd be curious to learn how um, how how Canada is is dealing with this. I'm I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> apologies for that. But but you know, for, from from my point of view, I, I I see these these like this bipolar conversation or scenarios between. The U.S. that is like very, very market driven. There's like very not little regulation, but it's definitely uh, less um, regulated than, than than Germany or Europe, for that matter. And then there and then there's China, where you have the like top down uh, government programs that just you know they 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 just by pure force um, put a ton of money into research and and they enable companies to to produce products and to be innovative. And in Germany, we're, we're like, we're neither here nor there. You know, we, we, we talk about a lot of things and, and, and we're, we're like very, very good at, 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 you know, coming up with every concern you might have. Um, so that is, that, that is disabling us a little bit, but I'm very curious to learn how the situation in Canada might be. Well, thank you for an opportunity to showcase my country. I always <laughs> like that. Um, uh, actually, it's it's very strange because there's um, there's one province in Canada, Quebec, where 25, 30 years ago, the government had this policy of uh, just um, investing in research, just pure research. And so it so happened that a couple of universities in Montreal uh, focused on you know computer science research, and we ended up ha attracting a lot of academics to Montreal to work on AI. And, uh, and some of these people would have had opportunities to go and work for Google and Microsoft and whatever in the States, but for a variety of reasons, um, chose to stay in Montreal because whatever quality of life and they had work there and they had a university feeding, funding the research just for research sake. So, so, so this group of people, um, you know, they're there, they're very dynamic. And for some reason, they have a very strong bias in terms of, okay, we're developing this AI and we want it to serve society. Mm -hmm. So I can't say that we have huge AI companies coming out of Montreal, um, you know, and, 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 and being going to be the next startup of tomorrow, the next unicorn. But they're all working on stuff to use AI to improve society in some way, shape, or form. So there's a declaration on res responsible use of AI that comes from Joshua Bengio, who's based in Montreal with University of Montreal and McGill. So they're working on that. And so so even though the environment is very permissive and the government has not particularly regulated that space and you could have companies come up with a variety of ideas, well, it seems that the pool of people that are there are conditioned by this idea that, well, we must use this AI to do good for society. And then as a government, I mean, I'm from foreign affairs, I'm not necessarily from the industry department, but our take is that, you know, developing AI with ethics in mind is not good. We want developers to have human rights framework in mind because ethics will change depending on your culture depending on like your business culture might be uh, well my, my ethics is i need to provide profit for my shareholders right right yeah. so ethics is a very <laughs> wide term but if you say you have to develop your ai based on the existing human rights framework you're pretty specific about what it is that you're allowed to do and of course in human rights law it's the governments that have a responsibility to promote and protect human rights but there's the guiding principles of 
the UN for private sector, uh, where you know companies are encouraged to abide by what the human rights law says and to make sure that what they do, you know, commercially does not harm human rights in, a, in any way, shape, or form, and to be mindful about human rights in the conception, development, implementation, testing phase, deployment phase. And so this is the kind of conversation we have with our private sector on AI. So I don't know if that answers your question, but Absolutely. that kind of in a nutshell is what <laughs> we do. So neither the US, neither Germany, neither Europe, we kind of have our own space. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, in the back, there's a... Hi, good day again. Kevin Swift from LACNIC. Um, I find the, the topic very interesting that you say that in Europe everything seems to be going slow. Um, we at LACNIC, we are also the secretariat to the LAC IGF, the Regional Process for Internet Governance of Latin America and the Caribbean. And we just celebrated our 12th edition this year in Bolivia. And I would say, despite all of us knowing that this is a very important topic for the region, for the very first time in this LAC IGF, in the very last session before the, the closing, um, we had just a very short discussion about all of 30 minutes on decision making with AI and the ethics around it. But it's interesting because whereas you recognize it is an important topic, we are still at the level where we are really more focused on things like community networks, access challenges, um, protection of human rights online. So without knowing, we always look towards Europe to say, okay, that's where the forefront of the activity is. As a matter of fact, I did a scanning exercise last year looking at um, trade associations, all sorts of entities, and where um, events on artificial intelligence were happening and 95 of the 100 and plus events I have found were happening in Europe. So it's interesting to hear this comment <laughs> as to where you feel. So you can imagine how we feel when we had three days of like IGF process and in the last half hour when many people had already left and gone sightseeing, we just started to discuss <laughs> the ethics around AI. Okay, thank you. But I guess that just goes to show that, you know, we just really enjoy talking about it, while other countries just keep developing and developing and developing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I know that you have to leave just in time. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's quarter past now. I have more questions uh, here that I would have loved to discuss. Um, yeah, if you are also interested in further discussing, you can stay here. I will stay here um, for a while. And I guess we can, maybe not in this huge room, but in a, a smaller circle, keep on discussing this topic. That's probably uh, fill enough uh, room until Friday and this end of the IGF. Um, but yeah, at this point, thank you for um, being in this session and discussing with us. And stay here if you like. Um, and if not, have a good evening and get home safely. Thank you.